Glad that y'all could be here this morning on the 4th of July weekend. It's usually a pretty busy holiday. A lot of people are out traveling, doing things. So I appreciate y'all being here this morning. Um, I actually had something different that I wanted to talk about a couple of months ago. I went through the book of Jonah and just kind of studied it and seen a lot of similarities in him and his life and how God had called him to do something specific and he didn't want to do it and he tried to flee from God and I thought that was interesting in how we approach things that God asks us to do and we try to run from those things and do other things but the more I tried to put something together pertaining to that I felt like God was leading us back to the idea that we're going to talk about this morning and so obviously this past Thursday was the 4th of July a day where we celebrate our independence we celebrate a time in American history where you know, the founding fathers got together, created this document, signed this document to break away from British control so that they could have the hope of having a better future for their children, their grandchildren, and the generations that would father, follow them. Um, hope. This past, about a week and a half ago, we had the first presidential debate. And I don't know if it was because I'm getting older or if it's because the Braves weren't playing, but I watched some of it to my, um, I don't know what word I want to use there, to, to my chagrin, I guess I could say. I did, it wasn't enjoyable, but the, the main theme that came away from both people, wherever you fall on whatever candidate you like or dislike, both of them had the same message. I'm the person that you should put your hope in to make your life better. I'm the one that you should choose to follow because if you choose this guy, he, things are going to be bad. Put your hope in me so that your life will be better, so that your day-to-day -day life will be better. Um, and so the idea of hope is really what I've been kind of wrestling with over the last few weeks and what we choose to put it in. The, the word hope is something that we use a lot. We throw it around all the time. We say, I hope it doesn't rain today so that I can cut the yard when I get off. Or, I hope that it clouds up this afternoon so it's not so hot at street reach. Or I hope that if I work hard enough this year, maybe I'll get a pay raise or maybe I'll get a promotion. I hope in this, I hope in that. We all just throw this word out all the time. I, I hope my wife cooks this for supper tonight. Like we use it so often that I think we've sort of lost the meaning of what the word hope really means, like what it really is at its core. And I think for sure we've lost the, the meaning of what true biblical hope is. And what we're going to find and what we're going to see this morning is that the way that we use hope, the way that we would sort of just throw it around like, you know, like my kid right now, John Parker's probably thinking, I hope dad hurries up so we can get on the road and go to the beach. Like how we throw that word around is so much different than what the Bible defines hope as and what we, what we choose to put it in versus what we choose, what the world would want us to put it in. And so this morning it's going to be a little similar to, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3, by the way, this morning, but it's going to be sort of similar to what I do with the youth, just try to dig out some things from the Bible, show you what hope is, and hopefully give you a better understanding of why it's important to put your hope in God and in the scriptures. Um, because that's the only thing that's going to sustain us through life. It's not going to be, you know, the founding of a country as great as that is. It's not going to be what candidate wins an election. Hope and what we choose to put it in, if we put it in biblical principles, that'll be what carries us uh, through our lives. So we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3 this morning, and I'm going to read verses 30, 13 through 17. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. It says, who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear them or be intimidated, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and reverence, keeping a clear conscience, so that when you are accused, those who disparge you, your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Verse 15 is kind of where we're going to really focus, where he says, be ready at any moment to give a defense for the hope that is in you. The hope that is in you. All right. 
So the Greek word there used for hope is elpis, elpis, E-L-P-I-S, which really just means an expectation of good. You're expecting something good. It's tied a lot to faith when you sort of look at it in Scripture and how it's translated in Scripture. But this word is used every time to translate hope. It's translated to hope all but twice in the Scripture, and the other two times is faith. So it's, it's sort of sisters or brothers, however you want to look at it, with faith. So hope and faith are kind of tied there together. But that's, that's how it's translated in Scripture is an expectation of good. But a couple of commentators that I was reading sort of, you know, because you, you think about the word hope, and, and if somebody were to ask you how would you define hope or how would you define biblical hope, like how would you really define it? That was the, the main thing that I wrestled with when I was looking at this is like how would I really define hope? Like I know I use the word all the time, and I sort of know what I mean when I use it. Like if I say I hope for something, that means I'm wanting that thing to happen. But, but a definition of it, how would I really define it? Well, I ran across two commentators that I thought that their definition of it was really good, and I want to share it this morning. It says they describe it as confident expectation and assurance in the fulfillment of God's promises, a firm belief based on faith in God's character and his word. I'll read that again. He says confident expectation and assurance in the fulfillment of God's promises, a firm belief based on faith in God's character and in his word. All right, so hope really could be translated from the scripture to us this morning as an expectation of good that God will fulfill his promises, where we can expect that he's going to do what he said, he's going to fulfill what he has said he's going to fulfill, he's going to honor his word, he's not going to go against it, like, the, that's our, our expectation that he will do that, our expectation that he will fulfill those promises. It's a faith really in who God is. It's a faith in who he is as, not as a person, but just as God. Like, it's faith in him. It's faith in, in him and his character and what he has said and what he stands for and all of that. So hope is really rooted in the fulfillment of God's promises, of the promises made to us by God. It's is sort of embedded, hope really at its core is faith and belief that God is going to fulfill the promises that he's already said to us and already given to us through scripture. And so if biblical hope is expecting, believing, having faith in the fulfillment of God's promises, like if that's what hope really is, is based all about these promises and God's word and God's character, if it's built around that, then how do we know that these promises are going to be fulfilled? How can we trust his word? Like it's a big thing to say that, you know, I trust somebody or I believe, I, I trust that somebody is gonna do what they say that they're gonna do. Um, but at the, in the back of your mind, you're always kind of thinking like, man, I really hope that, that I can trust them. Like if I say I trust this individual, whoever it may be, I trust this person to do what they say they're gonna do, like I may trust them, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, man, I really hope that, that they can be trusted here. I mean, I'm really counting on them. And so if, if, if biblical hope, right, if Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, if he tells us biblical hope, be ready to give an account for that hope that's in you. How can, and then hope is, is built all around the promises that God has given us. How can we trust the promises? Or can we trust the promises? Well, the, the, we can, and the first way we can is because he told us. In Matthew 24, 35, it says this. It says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Psalm 12, 6 through 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. <laughs> Psalm 89, 34 says, my, co my covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Joshua 23, 14 says, now behold, today I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you, not one of them has failed. Malachi 3.6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, these are just a few scriptures. I tried to pick some from the Old Testament, some in the Psalms, some in the New Testament. But you can go all throughout your Bible where God is constantly saying, my words aren't going to change. I'm going to keep my promises. 
My words aren't going to change. I've got to keep my promises. Whether he's dealing with us, the nation of Israel, whether David's writing in Psalms, it's everywhere all throughout Scripture where God consistently wants us to be aware that, hey, you're believing in me. You put your faith in me. I'm not going to change. My words aren't going to change, and I'm the same God yesterday, today, and forever. That's constant all throughout Scripture. So if our hope is based on the fulfillment of God's promises, he tells us right here that they won't change. We can trust them. We can trust what he says in the Bible. He's told us we can trust him. We believe that he can tr we, we can trust him. And so the question for us is, will we do it? Now, not only does he tell us that, it, that he won't change, not only does he tell us that you can, you can rely on me, you can rely on my promises, they won't change, I won't change, we also have evidence to support that. Not just trusting his word and like, okay, I believe you, God, that you said you wouldn't change, but show me how you haven't changed. All right, well, we can easily read through the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, and see things that God had promised certain people, how God had promised certain things to the nation of Israel, and we can see where he said the promises, but then we can also see the fulfillment of the promises. You think about at the very beginning, you think about Abraham. What was he promised? He was promised that he would have children, multiple generations. Uh, he would have children so numerous that he wouldn't be able to count them all. That was what was promised to Abraham. Well, we can read through scripture where the actual very nation of Israel was his descendants. We can see that the promise that God gave him was fulfilled. You think about Joshua when he was approaching the walls of Jericho and God says, hey, when you march around them on that last time you march, when you let out a shout, the walls are gonna fall down. As crazy as that probably sounded to Joshua, he did it. Well, what happened? Well, we read in Scripture that it, it happened exactly the way that God had promised him it would happen. You think about Moses and, and his place in Israel and leading them out of slavery and leading them out of Egypt. God told him, you're going to be the one to take them out of Egypt. You're going to be the one to lead them out of, of slavery that they've been in for so many years. You're going to be the one to do it. What do we see? We see that through the ten plagues and ultimately the parting of the Red Sea, we see how Moses did exactly what God promised him he would do. He led the nation of Israel out of slavery. And those are just three stories, you know, just off the top of my head that, that we can look at and we can say, not only did God say that we could trust him, not only did he say that he wasn't ever gonna change and that we could believe his promises and we can trust in his promises, we can actually have evidence to show that when he gave these promises, they actually happened. And that's just what's in the Bible. There are plenty of people that have testimonies and have stories where they went to God with something and they went to God believing in his promises and they seen the other side of that. And so we have to understand that if biblical hope is rooted in the fulfillment of God's promises, we can believe those promises because he told us we could believe them, but we can also believe those promises because we have evidence to show us that, you know, he will keep those promises and he will keep his word. And this is true throughout all the Bible. And so when you read in Deuteronomy 31 where he says, I'll never leave you and forsake you, you can trust that. You can believe that. When you read in Romans 8, 28 where he says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Those aren't just words. Those aren't just verses that are there to make you feel good when you're having a bad day. Like you can believe those verses. You can trust in those verses because God has told us he's not going to change. And we have the evidence to support that he actually isn't going to change. Um, all of the Bible, all the things that God has done, all the things that he said, everything that we can see about God is showing us who God is. It's showing us the character of God. I think the biggest thing that I've seen through working with the youth through, through the years is that they have this view of God as this person who is just wanting to rule over their life and just hold them down and suppress them and like... You, you will submit to me and you will do exactly what I say to do. And, you know, there's an element of truth to that. But, you know, we get so caught up and so focused on viewing God that way that we don't really understand who God is. We don't really understand the character of God. We don't really understand that God loves us and he wants good things for us and that he desires good things for us. Like we, we just view him this certain way. But all of Scripture through stories and things that he's done is all pointing us to who God is, the character of God. And biblical hope is confidence in that character, all right? It's confidence in who God is. It's confidence in, in what he's all about and how he views us and how he sees us. 
And this is why I, I think it's so important, and the most important thing ever for Christians, far more than, than being faithful to God. And I'm not saying faith, being faithful to God and living obedient to God isn't important, because obviously it is. But I think at the beginning, it's so important to know your Bible, not just as information so that you can say, okay, yeah, John 3.16 says this, and Psalm 23 says this, and like, it's not just information for us. Knowing our Bible is essentially how we get to know God. It's how we get to know what he says about us, how he views us, how he views situations, what he wants from us, what he expects of us, what he expects of us in, in random, you know, what we would think, you know, just by happenstance, circumstances, how does he want us to operate in those things? Like, knowing your Bible is the most important thing for a Christian because, like I said, it shows us who God is. We can't have confidence in something that we don't know. We can't trust in something that we don't know. How can we hope in God if we don't really know who God is? How can we trust in the promises of God if we don't know what those promises are? Like, I could say in here this morning, if somebody had, was needing knee surgery, I could say to myself, I have confidence and trust in my ability that I'm going to perform that surgery. Now, I can't. Why? Because I don't know nothing about it. I know you cut somebody open, and that's all I know. Maybe. I don't even know if you do that. But, you know, the point is, if I don't know nothing about that, I can't do it. I can't get on an airplane and fly it from here to, to Jackson because I don't know nothing about it. We can't trust in God. We can't hope in God. We can't put our true hope in God unless we know him, unless we know who he is and know his character. I'm not saying strictly have a relationship with him. That's, that's the, the beginning, establishing a relationship with God. But then, man, you got to get to know him. And the main way you get to know him is through the scripture because that's where he tells you who he is. That's where he tells you what he's all about. That's where he tells you what he expects of you and, and sort of how he wants you to, to live your life. And so that's really a, a general understanding of hope. It's really just confidence in God. It's confidence in God and what he's already said. I think that's the, the best and easiest way um, to sum up what true biblical hope is. So why is that important? Why is it important to know what hope is? And more importantly, why is it important to have hope in God, not in hope in the things of this world, not hope in a presidential candidate, not hope in your job, not hope in your own abilities, but why is it important to have hope in God? Well, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. I'll read it one more time because the, the stuff that's that's about to take place here in 1 Peter. We'll get to it here in a minute, but it's really fascinating. But 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, I'll read it again. He says, But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Give a, be ready to give a defense for the hope that is in you. Now, let's do a little background on 1 Peter because it's what is happening around 1 Peter that gives what he says the weight of here in verse 15. Now, obviously it's written by Peter, a very prominent, influential person in the New Testament, uh, walked with Jesus, he was right there with him, and he was right into Christians who had been scattered about. He wasn't right into a specific church, like you, know, you read in, in the New Testament, Galatians, Philippians, like he wasn't right into a specific congregation, he was right into Christians who were scattered about, um, it says that he wrote it around 62 or 63 A.D., just before Nero would begin his persecutions, his persecution of the Christians, where Peter himself would actually be martyred under this persecution around 66 A.D. So when we read the things that we read in 1 Peter and on into 2 Peter, it's important to view them with this context in mind. All right? It's important to view them with the understanding that for Christians, their whole world was about to be turned upside down. Like, you could argue that the fact that Jesus being crucified was a very dark day for Christians, and it was. But they know that Jesus rose from the dead. They, they were able to, to, to know that, to some to see that. But what they were about to face under Nero was unlike anything that had happened on the earth before, and maybe since then, from the type of persecution that they were about to face. Um, and some of the ways that Nero would persecute Christians, I'll just name a few. Um, public crucifixion was a big way. He was big on, I'm going to crucify you the same way that your Savior was crucified. 
He would do this publicly. Peter, it's famous that he was asked, he asked when he was crucified if he would be crucified upside down because he didn't want to die the same way his Savior did. Um, they were forced to fight wild animals. They would put them in these arenas and the Christians would be forced to, to fight these animals. Obviously, they would, would fight and, and to their death. He would burn Christians alive. He would put them in tar and put them on stakes and, and set them on fire, and they were used to light gardens at night and different things. Um, public beheadings was a big one for him. Paul would actually die this way under Nero's rule. And these are just a few of the ways. You know, we got small kids in here, so I won't go too detailed in some of the ways that he tortured Christians. But, but man, when you read about it and you study on it, he brutalized Christians. He hated them. He brutalized them. You know, and, and we can't relate to that because it doesn't really cost us a whole lot to be a Christian in America in 2024. Maybe one day it will, but today it doesn't. And we can't really relate to the idea of somebody opening those back doors and doing some of these things that Nero was doing to Christians. But that's what was about to take place when Peter writes what he writes in verse 15. All of this stuff is literally about to happen when he writes what he writes in verse 15. Be ready to give a hope. Be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you. They were about to be put in a situation where all they could really count on, all they could really rely on is their hope in God. Not hope in anything earthly. Their money wasn't going to be able to save them if they had that. Their position in society wasn't going to be able to save them. Their friends and family wasn't going to be able to save them. There was nothing that they could do to prevent, as Christians, to prevent what was about to happen when Nero started his persecution to Christians or at own Christians. Death was really their only certainty. That's all they could really look forward to is, is a swift death so that they wouldn't have to deal with some of the things that they were about to have to deal with. And so their hope in him and his eternal promises would be the only thing that they had to, to hold on to. I don't know that we have, maybe some people, and I'm sure there are some in here that that's all, that you've been in a place in your life that that's all you've been able to hold on to. I don't know that I've ever been in a place where all I really had was the hope in God. And that, that sounds really sad. That sounds really bad to say that. But that's where these Christians were. They didn't have anything else to hope in but God. And so what Peter is really saying in verse 15 is what he's really saying is when this stuff starts, when you start being brutalized, when you start being mistreated, when you start being killed for your very faith in Jesus Christ, be ready to give an account for why you won't stop serving him, why you won't stop believing in him, why you won't stop serving him and loving him. When people ask, hey, you know they're killing people like you, why are you still serving Jesus? Be ready to give an account for that. Be ready to give an account for the fact that I'm holding on to the hope that Jesus says that he'll never leave me or forsake me. I'm holding on to the hope that Jesus has already told me that there's a place waiting for me in heaven. I'm holding on to all this stuff. And so Nero can do what he wants, but I'm holding to all this stuff. Peter's saying, be ready to give a defense for that type of hope. The hope in God and what he has said and the promises that he has already made. Give a reason why you won't stop trusting in Jesus and won't stop believing in God. That's essentially what Peter was telling them, is that you're going to be put in a position where all you can rely on is the things that Jesus taught you, the things that I've taught you, the things that Paul's taught you about God and who he is and how much he loves you, like hold on to that and let that carry you through this persecution. And when people ask you why you won't give up, tell them it's because of your, your faith and your trust in Jesus. And so you can ask yourself, well, how did it end for the Christians in Rome? How did it go for them after Nero did what he did uh, to the Christians there? Well it spread pretty rapidly. In fact, 300, roughly 300 years after Nero's persecution on Christians, Rome would institute that Christianity would be the official religion of Rome. So you think like 300 years, that seems like a really long time, but in the grand scheme of, of history, it's really not. You take a situation where Nero says, I'm going to kill Christians. They're such a nuisance and a problem and a burden for me. I'm going to eliminate them from the face of the earth. That was his goal. That was his objective. Peter tells him, look, you're about to go through this. Hold on to your faith in God. Hold on to your hope in God and let that carry you. 
All right, 300 years later, now the official religion of Rome was Christianity. And you can't help but draw a conclusion between those two and say that this occurred because of the hope that they had in Jesus. And not only the hope that they had in that, but their proclamation of that hope. Like, you know, when time, you think about hard days that you've had in your life, um, you know, how easy is it to, to feel sorry for yourself or how easy is it to feel pity for yourself and to think, man, you know, gosh, you know, I, I got financial situation is really tough right now. You know, I just don't see any, any end in sight. I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. Life's tough for me right now. Um, I got a bad diagnosis at the doctor, man. Life's tough for me right now. Life's, you know, it's, it's so easy to fall into that. And you think about these people and what they were dealing with and how much more it was important for them to have hope in God. And we struggle with having that same type of hope in God and that same type of biblical hope in who Jesus is and what he's already said and the promises that he's already given us. But I think it's very interesting that just 300 years later, the official religion of Rome would be Christianity. So what about us? Like, we're probably never going to face that type of persecution that these Christians face. I don't think we will. Maybe we will. Maybe I'll be, you know, sitting one day and thinking, man, it really happened to us. But I don't think we'll ever face that type of persecution that these people did. But that doesn't mean that we don't have our own struggles. That doesn't mean that we don't have our own battles. That doesn't mean that the things that we're dealing with aren't important. Um, one thing I'm learning as the older I get is that you can be dealing with things or you can be struggling with things in your life that seem very, very small compared to what somebody else is dealing with. But that doesn't mean that the things that you're struggling with or the things that you're dealing with aren't important to God. Because when you come to God with those things, no matter how small you may think they are, to God it's the most important thing ever. And we all deal with, with battles and struggles and, and, and things like that. You know, it may not be as severe as what these people dealt with here in, in First Peter, but we all still have struggles and, and, and tr troubles that we face. So that leads to the question really is, how do we approach them? Because Peter told, told those people, like, this is how you're going to approach the battles that you're about to face. You're going to face it with hope in God, and then you're going to give a defense for that hope when people ask you. So how do we deal with some of those things? I think that's, that's one thing we should consider, and um, that sort of leads to that question. I think one way we do that, one way we try to deal with our struggles is we try to tailor the things that God has said in Scripture to our own personal life. Like, we say, you know, I can live however I want to live. <clears throat> I can spend money like it's on fire, like I have no tomorrow. And then when I'm broke and I can't pay my bills, I'll pull out Romans 8, 28 and say, well, God, you did say all things were going to work together for the good of those who love him or called according to his purpose. So I've spent all my paycheck and I still have all these bills and there's no food in the house. Make it work. Or maybe we look at Deuteronomy 31, 6, where he told them, you know, I will never leave you or forsake you. I think sometimes we can look at that and be like, man, I treat everybody like crap. I, you know, in my relationships in my life, I'm a jerk to everybody, and I, I, I hate everybody, and I'm mean to everybody. And then when we're sitting at home alone, well, God, you did say you would never leave me or forsake me. Like, like we, we get this idea that we can live our lives however we want to live them, with no consequences, with no repercussions. And then we find these little promises that God has given, and we try to tailor them to our specific situation without any sort of context, without any sort of biblical context of what God is saying in those promises. Um, and so I think that's, that's one way that we sort of try to deal with the problems in our life instead of examining maybe, okay, did I bring any of this on myself? Is it based on it, the things I'm dealing with? Is that based on the way that I've been living my life? Have I been living outside of the way God has called me to live? Is that why some of this stuff is happening? Or is it just happening because it's some part of some plan or part of some will that you have for my life that I don't understand? Like, I think that's one way we deal with it. I think another, another way we deal with it is um, we approach the challenges of life and we just assume that God's going to show up and pull us out of that. Like we're in a really bad spot or we're really struggling with something and we think God's going to show up one afternoon and just pull us completely out of that. 
I mean, can he do that? Yeah. Does he do that? Sometimes, yeah, he does that. But it's not always the case, but it's a very popular belief today. Um, I think one of the more common things that is starting to occur is we're living in the end times. You know, gas is up, inflation is up, this is up, that is up, life is hard, we're dealing with this, Russia's doing this, Israel's doing this, and we just get this attitude of, and we're living in the end times, so the things I'm struggling with, the things I'm dealing with, man, I'm just gonna hunker, I'm just gonna hunker down, and I'm just gonna wait for God to pull me out of it so I don't have to deal with it anymore. And I think that line of thinking takes us away from the purpose that God has for us. It takes us away from what God is wanting to do through our lives here on this earth. If you flip back one chapter in 1 Peter chapter 2, I want us to look at one thing that, that Peter tells these people. And again, remember what's about to happen when he tells them this. All of the stuff that I just said about Nero, all that stuff's fixing to happen. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 through 10, that's what I'll read here. He says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by people, but chosen and honored by God, you yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honor will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone. And a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over, they stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. But you, talking about Christians here, this is talking about us, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possessions, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into this marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. He says, you have been called to proclaim the praises of the one who called you. I think we, they, read, they sang the song this morning, uh, Christ the Cornerstone, and I actually had to look this up to really get the understanding of like, what is a cornerstone? But it basically, just to sum it up, it's like what everything else is built off of. You know, in masonry, they, do it, they use it a lot. It's, it's like the, the starting point. And Peter says that you as Christians, we're being built up as living stones. Like God is, is his kingdom here on earth. You think about the, the model prayer that we use, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like God is trying to accomplish his kingdom and his kingdom agenda here on earth. He's, he's building that first with Jesus and then we're being built up as living stones on top of that. Why? So that we can proclaim the praises of the one who has called us so that we can point other people toward him. God is trying to build this big group of kingdom people, his people, so that we can proclaim who he is to the world and to others. Now, that sounds cool. Like, if, if I had 20, 30 more minutes, like, and, and maybe if I was Brother Mason, I would just do it. But um, that, like, that's, that's, that, you know, that's really cool, like, that, that God would love us and care about us so much that he would say, you know what, I'm going to create this big, wonderful, huge thing and I'm going to let you be a part of it, and I'm going to build it up with you, with your talents, with your personality, with your strengths, even with your weaknesses. I'm going to build this huge kingdom, and we're going to go out, and we're going to accomplish my will here on this earth so that people will know who I am and so that they can have hope in me and they can have true hope in me. Not hope in all this stuff that the world is going to tell them they should have hope in, but hope in me and who I am. And we get to be a part of that. And I think that's really cool, but I think a lot of times... You know, we look at that and we're like, that sounds good and that sounds wonderful and that, that, you know, that gets me excited, that gets me fired up. But tomorrow is Monday and I got to go back to work and I don't like my job and I don't feel like I get paid enough. And the struggles and the, tr the, the things that we deal with start eating away at that and start bringing, bringing us down. Now, Peter told this to these people in chapter 2 right before all this would start happening with Nero. So he tells them, like, look, God has chosen you. You're a royal nation. A chosen, like, you're, a you're a group of people that God views as special, and he's going to use you. But in a few years, you're going to face a lot of persecution. Peter didn't say, just stay in your home and wait for God to take you out of it. Peter didn't say, um, you know, do the best you can with your own abilities, positive thinking. Like, Peter just said, put your hope in God, 
true hope in God and his promises, endure. And when people ask you why you're enduring, tell them it's because of the hope that you have in me or in Jesus. Excuse me. So that's that's our purpose. That doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that life will be easy. But just like the first century Christians, we have to have hope in God and not only have hope in God, um, but we have to have a willingness to tell other people why we're enduring and why we have hope in God. That's sort of another element to this hope thing and having hope in God. Is it for us? Yes. Is it for the, our lives and the things that we go through? Yes. But it's not only for us. Hope is something that we should be willing to give other people as well. I think it was, was it last Sunday or the Sunday before in Sunday school where we went over the idea of intersections and how we cross paths with people all the time and we have opportunities to minister to people all the time and it's about being able to recognize when you're in one of these moments and, and being, you know, having the courage to try to give hope to these people. Um, and man, that's really hard. That's really an uncomfortable thing to do because we're just so, we're so taught to keep, your, keep to yourself, mind your own business. Um, if somebody needs help, they'll come to you and ask you for help. And we just lose focus on the idea that God has just told us in 1 Peter chapter 2, like I'm building something great so that you can proclaim the, the praises of who called you. And we, we have these moments, man, where we come across these intersections. And those are prime opportunities that God wants to use us to give hope to other people. Um, but like I said, it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. It can be, you know, challenging. It may take courage. Um, I can remember a couple of weeks ago we were in Atlanta. And anytime we go somewhere, especially to a bigger city like Atlanta, I'm always super cautious and hypersensitive to what's going on around me because I you know, you want to make sure my kids and my wife are taken care of, Nothing, nothing's going on around us. And so we go to this ice cream place um, right, out, right out across from our hotel, not too far from our hotel. And it's super packed and there's people there and they don't look like me, they don't talk like me. And I'm not just talking about black and white, I'm just mean like these people are speaking languages I don't know and it's just, it's Atlanta, it's a big city, you know. And so I'm watching and I'm looking around and it's a table over here and these two guys are speaking in another language. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, you know, I see these guys over here and we order our food and I notice out of the corner of my eye, one of the guys is talking to John Parker. Now I didn't run up on him now. Maybe I probably looked at him a little funny, but I started walking up to try to figure out what was going on and all he was trying to do was give John Parker a napkin or something. He had spilled ice cream or something, I don't remember. But then he got to talking to me and, and I don't remember the beginning of the conversation and how the conversation started. But I do remember him telling me like, two days ago I just gave my life to Christ and he's, you know, he starts telling me these things that he's wanting to happen in his life and these things that he's wanting to do. And this guy, man, he does not look anything like us. It's like so, he, this would be the kind of guy, man, just covered in tattoos that you would look at and you'd be like, man, you know, you, maybe you should stay away from him. And I knew I could feel it, man. I could feel it in my spirit. Like, God, I know that you want me to explain a lot about the basics of Christianity to this guy because he didn't, and he didn't know a lot. He knew who Jesus was and that was enough. But all I was thinking about was I got to watch out for my family. I got to take care of them. I got to get them away from the situation. And the, the thing that, that hits you the most is when your kids call you out on stuff, when, when they tell you you should have done something and you know you should have done it. And John Parker said, why didn't you talk to him about God? He tried to talk to you about God and you wouldn't do it. It's like, oh man. But, but we're in those situations all the time whether we're willing to see them. I think that's the main thing we gotta do first is put ourselves in a mindset to be willing to see when people are, when we're being led to people and we're, we're being led to show them who God is. Like we gotta be willing to do that first and then and then do it because we're around people all the time who are living without hope and who don't know Jesus and who are putting their hope in all of these things in the world. And we just read in chapter three that there's going to be times in life where those things are going to fail. Ultimately, they're all going to fail. You know, you may can rely on your money for a certain period of time, but eventually it's going to fail. You may can rely on your, your position and status in the city and your, in life, and you may be able to rely on that for, for a certain time, but eventually it'll end as well. But we're all around people who don't have hope in Christ. Not only is it important that we place our hope in him and trust in him, it's also important that we give that hope to other people when we have the opportunity and we have the chance. So 
The question that we're sort of left with this morning, I think, is where are we placing our hope? Are we placing it in the things of the world or are we placing it where Peter tells us we got to place it and that's in God? I wish that I could stand up here and say that I've always put my hope in God and that I've never put it in anything else other than God, but I would be lying if I said that. We all, you know, sometimes rely on things of this world and, and we, you know, put our hope in it rather than God. But, you know, some examples would be, you know, if we're struggling with money, oh, well, I'm just going to go find me a better job that pays me more money. If I'm struggling with relationships, oh, I'm just going to go find somebody else to be with that meets my needs or whatever it may be. We've all put our hope in our, in our own abilities and our own means. But the true hope that's unfading, that will never fail us, is found in God and what he has already told us in Scripture. And whatever we're struggling with this morning, if it's a huge, big thing, like I said, um, or if it's a super small thing that we don't think is all that important, whatever it is, what are we seeking? Where are we trying to find our answers to those problems? Are we trying to find the answers to those problems with other things or with God? If it's anything other than God, then the only thing we can do this morning is just ask that, that God would forgive us of that and help us to place our hope in him and trust in him. Because when you're going through life, you, you know, your first instinct isn't always to rely on a scripture that God's already told you. Your first instinct is to just, how do I fix this problem? How do I deal with it? When we've been given so many examples of God saying, man, this is what I've said. You can trust it. You can believe it. You can rely on it. And, and I think that if we focus more on the hope that the Bible talks about and not the hope that the world offers us, we will be so much more effective of this kingdom-minded people that is seeking to proclaim the praises of the one that called us. So I'll, um, we'll have a time of reflection this morning, and then, then we'll close. But as we have a time of reflection, I just, just take a moment, however you feel comfortable, and just think in your minds of the times that you have put your hope in God and how that went for you when you didn't put your hope in God and what, how that went for you and really ultimately what you put your hope in overall. Do I put my hope in God? Do I not put my hope in God? And then sort of reflect on that. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and God, we love you and we thank you that you care enough about us to give us this hope that we've just talked about. So many other religions believe in gods and rely on gods that have no way of supplying the type of hope that you do. And so, Father, we thank you that you care about us. We thank you that you love us enough to give us that. And, Father, as we have a moment to reflect this morning, I just ask that you stir in our hearts and help us to start thinking about ways that maybe we don't put our whole hope in you, that we don't put our trust in you and maybe ways that we can do that better and to really be sold out and put all of our hope and put all our chips in on you, Lord, and, and, what, and what you've already said to us and about us in Scripture. Lord, um, we're all dealing with situations in here this morning, big, small, in between. Help us to just see those things through your lens and through your eyes and through the Scriptures uh, that you've already written to us. Lord, help us to wrestle with this and help us to really think on it. And it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen.